Right. Okay, thanks very much. <clears throat> so, <laughs> I apologize, I'm recovering from a cold, so I'll be popping a little bit, but uh, I'm glad to keep that down. Um, so I'm going to be talking about quantized inertia, which is a theory I've suggested, and I'll first go through the theory, uh, <clears throat> and then I'll, I'll give you some empirical proof for it, then I'll talk about some applications that I've suggested, and then one of them being possibility of interstellar travel. So. And then just to show that I have not just come off the street, um, I've got a BSc in physics from York, UK, PhD in ocean physics. I was a scientist at the UK Met Office forecasting ocean waves. <coughs> I've been a lecturer in geomatics at Plymouth University for a while. And I've published about 26 papers proposing this theory, and also three books as well. And one principle, uh, because I'm, I'm speaking to the, the Charlottesville Astronomical Society, I thought I'd mention Thomas Jefferson, who I think lived close to you, if, if this is the correct Charlottesville. Um, and one principle I try to follow in science is brevity, and he had a, a fantastic uh, way of articulating that. So the most valuable of all talents is that of never using two words when one will do uh, Thomas Jefferson. So that's a very good principle that I've tried to apply to my physics on, on many levels, as you will see. Try to keep it simple. Okay, so inertia has never been well understood. This is the tendency of objects to keep going in a straight line unless you, you force them to stop or push on them. So here's a ladder <clears throat> on a, a lorry, the lorry hits the car, and the ladder continues straight on because it has an inertial mass. Inertial mass is not due to the Higgs field, which only explains a very tiny amount of the mass. <coughs> Excuse me, not by one percent. So I propose a new model for inertia, which actually explains it for the first time, which combines relativity and quantum mechanics. So I have to go into a bit of physics to do to explain this. <clears throat> so the first thing I need to explain is the quantum background of the zero point field. So Werner Heisenberg, who's shown the top right, suggested the formula that the momentum uncertainty of a quantum system times its position uncertainty has to be more than a constant at, at a particular number. <clears throat> Which means that if you consider a smaller and smaller region of space, so your position uncertainty decreases because you know exactly where you are, then the momentum uncertainty has to increase. So this means on the smaller scales, space is broken up and there are lots of particles milling around, as I've tried to show in this uh, bottom right hand figure. This also means that you get lots of virtual particle pairs appearing, so I've tried to show that with these blue arrows. So this is a, a positron and an electron forming and then recombining a bit later on. <clears throat> and this is happening all the time at this, this smallest scale, according to Heisenberg. And these particles are also associated with uh, quantum waves, which I've tried to show with these red curves. So space at the smaller scales is teeming with momentum. <clears throat> So is it is it true? Well, Hendrik Casimir, who I've shown here, said that if okay, if this is true, then if you put two conducting plates very close together, what will happen is that they will allow some of the quantum waves, like this top one here, <clears throat> but some of the waves, like this this middle one, uh, will be cancelled because you see there's a, a peak in the wave here, and so the field is not zero. And so the electrons in the plate are going to move to cancel the field. So this one won't fit, and this wave won't fit either. So they'll disappear, <clears throat> and this means there'll be more particles outside banging into the plates, pushing them in, and fewer particles inside pushing them out. So you'll get a force pushing the plates together. And that will prove the existence of this, um, this uh, zero-point field, this quantum background. So this was done in only in quite recently, in 1997, and it was shown that uh, Casimir was, was right, and Heisenberg as well. 
Okay. <clears throat> so part of my background is in the ocean. <clears throat> so I'm just going to give you an example here of a similar thing. Let's see. So imagine you have a ship close to a dock. So there's a ship, there's a dock. Seaward of the ship, there'll be a lot of waves. But between the ship and the dock, there won't be as many because only certain waves will be able to exist. So this wave here that, that I've shown can exist because the wave in the center will be moving up and down, but at the side it'll be moving hardly at all up and down. So there'll be no friction. The wave will survive. <clears throat> this means there'll be more waves hitting the ship from this side than from, the, than from this side, so the ship will move towards the dock. And this is called the maritime Casimir effect because it's very similar to the, the physics Casimir. <clears throat> so here we have a dock damping waves, docking the ship, but there are other ways to do it. <clears throat> Another kind of dock or wall or plate is a horizon. So this is quite an abstract concept I'm going to have to ex try to explain. If you have a plane here and there's an explosion close to it, emitting sound waves, then if the plane is accelerating away, if it's accelerating fast enough, the sound waves won't catch up with it. So we can say that this, this explosion is behind a horizon or the plane. So anything beyond this line here will not be heard by the plane as it's accelerating away. So I'd like you to try and remember this concept of the horizon. <clears throat> there are other kinds of horizons, so there's a black hole event horizon, so if you have a concentration of mass here, it stops light escaping from a particular region of space, and you get a black hole event horizon. And Stephen Hawking famously thought about this, and he realized that if you have this quantum background, and one of these particle pairs was emitted right on the boundary, then one of the particles will come out, perhaps the electron, and one of them would go inside the black hole, but we know that anything that goes inside a black hole uh, is lost forever from the outside world. So that will disappear. <clears throat> and now, usually, whereas these two particles will recombine, this poor, uh, this poor particle won't be able to recombine with its twin, so it will be emitted. And that's now called Hawking radiation. But that hasn't been seen yet. <clears throat> About the same same time, <coughs> shortly afterwards, a guy called Bill Unruh from Vancouver said a similar thing would happen to an accelerating object, uh, like this plane here. <clears throat> if it's accelerating to the right, then it will see a horizon again, uh, which is actually called a Rindler horizon. <clears throat> and similarly, if a particle pair is emitted on the horizon, the one that goes behind the horizon will be lost from the point of view of the plane, and its twin won't be able to be combined anymore, so you'll get radiation coming off, which is now called Unruh radiation, named after Bill Unruh. So this means that any accelerating object will see radiation surrounding it, whereas an object that's not accelerating in the same space would not see that radiation. So it's kind of peculiar. <clears throat> but I've used this radiation to explain inertial mass. <clears throat> well, so if you think of this black ball as accelerating to the right, then <clears throat> first thing is that it will see this on radiation. So I've tried to show that with this red uh, dappled effect here. This is radiation which will be uh, striking the object from in front and pushing it back. But the object, because of relativity and this, this idea that we've got a horizon, will see a horizon behind it. And the new proposal I have is that this horizon uh, damps, interacts with the radiation, just like the dock uh, damps the waves near, near to the ship. So you get fewer Unruh waves on this side between the object and the horizon, just as you did, you got fewer ocean waves between the ship and the dock. This means that there are fewer Unruh waves hitting it from this side and more hitting it from the right, so it'll be pushed back against its acceleration. <clears throat> and I managed to show in a paper in 2013 that this predicts what we see <coughs> as inertial mass. Uh, 
Okay, so that predicts the initial mass, although at the time in 2013, I made a factor of two error, which was corrected uh, by, by a colleague of mine, Chao Mei in 2016. Yeah. But it predicts initial mass. And just to prove that this under radiation that I'm using is real, it was actually confirmed years later in, in 2021 by uh, Lin Shetal. They, they were looking at high energy positrons, which were hitting silicon crystals and decelerating very rapidly. And they saw radiation coming off, which looks just like unruh radiation. So, um, this was, and he actually emailed me very excitedly to tell me that he'd, he'd seen unruh radiation, which was a relief to me because I'd been using it for more than 10 years. Okay, so in his paper is, uh, is shown here. <clears throat> okay, but there's a slight difference to this model of inertia. It makes inertia slightly more complex than we're used to, because if you have an object with a very low acceleration, then this horizon moves very far back. <clears throat> and if the acceleration is low enough, it moves so far back that we can't see it anymore. There's something called the cosmic horizon, which is very far away, 10 to the 26 meters. Um, and as soon as the Rindler horizon moves behind the cosmic horizon, it becomes irrelevant then. So this, this inertial mechanism should start to collapse. Because now, <clears throat> there's unreal radiation all around the particle symmetrically, and there's no difference between the two sides. So inertia should disappear at very low acceleration. <clears throat> And I published this first back in 2007 in this, this paper too. But this is exactly what we need to model galaxies without dark matter. So this is the Andromeda galaxy here. And a star, if you take a star at the edge of it, they've seen, uh, they've, they've added up the mass of the galaxy by counting the number of stars you can see, the, the visible, visible matter. So they know what the gravitational force should be. And they've looked using Doppler shift at the stellar motions, the speed of the stars at the edge. And they found that they're moving far too rapidly to be held in. The centrifugal force should be uh, pushing them away from the galaxy. But galaxies are pretty stable objects. So this is obviously not happening. <clears throat> so what is the reason? Well, the reason is that the, the stars at the edge of the galaxy are accelerating at a very low, um, uh, only very slowly, because they have to, uh, the, the curve they're moving in is very slight. <clears throat> so this means that according to the theory I'm proposing, they've lost inertial mass, and it turns out that they lose inertial mass by just exactly the right amount that the centrifugal force reduces, so it exactly balances the gravity from the visible matter only. So it, it works perfectly, it doesn't need any adjustment. The theory works perfectly. It's, it's pretty simple, and you only need to predict your galaxy, you only need the visible mass, stars, speed of light, and the Hubble Doppler scale. So I published this in two papers in 2012 and 2017. And okay, but there's well, there's an even more direct test that I can show you to prove it. If you look at a galaxy, so this is a schematic of a galaxy, the center is moving, the stars in the center are moving around very rapidly. So they see short on the waves, like the red curve at the bottom. As you move out to greater radii, then the acceleration reduces, so the stars are now seeing longer on the waves. But exactly the radius, where the acceleration is low enough that the waves become the size of the Hubble horizon, the, the size of the cosmos, that's the exact point at which galaxies start to behave differently. So this proves, without a doubt, really, that it's due to unruh radiation and quantized inertia, the theory I'm suggesting, which uses unruh radiation. Okay, so that's a, a pretty direct test. <clears throat> so there's some more evidence from wide binaries. I don't know if you've observed uh, many, many of these, but there are some stars that are gravitationally bound even though they're very far apart. So, uh, for example, uh, more than 7,000 AU apart. It's called wide binaries. And they orbit very slowly. And their acceleration is very, 
small and they're in the correct regime to, to show this effect. And in fact, they do. They, they orbit each other far more rapidly than physics, normal physics allows. So does quantized inertia <coughs> work on them? Well, it, yes, it does. It uh, predicts their, their motion, um, uh, very well. So, uh, if you want to see the details, you can look at my paper here. Um, but this is a nice animation that was produced by my postdoc, Jesus Lucio. And this shows two wide binary stars, these red dots, and it models their, their orbits based on standard physics. So this, this would be the blue line using Newton or general relativity, um, using MOND, which is a green line, which is a, a rival theory, I guess you could say, and what I'm suggesting, quantized inertia. So if we, if we run this, we know that wide binary stars are bound together. So which theory predicts that they are bound? Uh, so Newton, GR, and Mond do not predict them to be bound, but QI does, they stay bound. And that's because they've lost inertial mass, so the centrifugal force pushing them away is reduced. Okay, so you can look at the details in this paper below if you, if you want. Okay, so the great thing about this in terms of practicality is that if we can understand inertia, we can control it in a new way. <clears throat> For example, normally, in order to get something to take off, we have to use a chemical explosion, which is very dangerous. We have to blast hot gas out the bottom of a rocket so that the rocket conserved momentum will, will move up or upwards. But with this new uh, theory of inertia, what we can do instead is to have, if we have, say, a very highly accelerated object, so you could think of something spinning around very rapidly inside a shell, or at least moving very rapidly. <clears throat> then, if you make it accelerate rapidly enough, it'll see very short onward waves. The higher the acceleration, the shorter the waves. And if you make them short enough, onward waves are usually very long, light years long, but if you make them short enough, a centimeter scale, uh, then you could put a metal plate above this object and it will damp it. It will interact with these only waves. And now you'll have only waves pushing the object from below and not from above. <clears throat> so it will move up. And what this means is that you've got a propellantless thruster. You've got a, something that will move without expelling propellant. <clears throat> okay, so this would be very useful. Um, so, <clears throat> I started publishing papers um, uh, proposing this to us, and I was contacted by, by DARPA, so that's the US Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, which is based in Arlington, Virginia, so it's not, not far from me. And um, I applied for funding and was awarded $1.3 million to try and prove this in the, the lab. So I've been trying to do that for, for the uh, past six, six years or so. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> but luckily I was, I was very open in what I was doing and DARPA allowed that. And uh, two guys, um, uh, Frank Becker and Anke Bat read my papers and suggested instead of, um, a photon cavity that I was using, they suggested a capacitor setup. <clears throat> and in the years with me, they, they tried it in the lab. So what they did was they got the capacitor, so it's shown here, with a cathode, which emits electrons, which jump across to the anode here, positive charge, the positive plate. <clears throat> so it's a bit like Casimir, uh, Casimir's uh, two plates, actually, but with a dielectric in between, <clears throat> which means that the electrons have to uh, quantum tunnel Across, across the gap. And the great thing about this is that when they quantum tunnel, tunnel from the cathode to the anode, they accelerate at about the rate of 10 to the 20 meters per second per second. And so they see other waves that are short enough to be damped by the, by these plates. So they put the capacitor on a digital scale. They put a power supply in, the potential difference was about 5 kilovolts. The current across was very small, about 10 microamp. 
and they saw changes in mass, which were very close to what I was predicting with the field. <clears throat> so just to show you the data, so on the x-axis we have the separation between the plates. So this is from about 120 micron here down to about 10 micron. Uh, so a micron is uh, 10 to minus 6 meters. <clears throat> and you can see the force of the y-axis up to about 6 millimeters. And you can see that as you reduce the separation of the plates, the data, the, the observations of the black diamonds show the, um, the force they were seeing increased exponentially. And the theory I'm proposing uh, agrees. That's shown by the, the squares. So if you want to see more details on that, you can read my paper here, which is on the search game. <clears throat> so what do I think has happened? <clears throat> well, normally in quantized inertia, in this, this theory, if an electron accelerates to the right, it sees under waves in front of it, but fewer under waves behind because of this horizon, which is damping them. So it gets pushed back, and this is the normal inertial mass. But in a capacitor, everything has changed because now, uh, when you, when the particle accelerates forward, there could be under waves out here. The other waves are still damped back here, but they're now also damped between the plates because the plates are damping the waves, if you like. So <clears throat> the inertial mass has been reduced. The initial mass of the electron has been reduced. This means that its momentum towards the right has reduced. So in order to conserve momentum, the capacitor itself has to move to the right. This momentum always has to be conserved. So if you want to see the maths on this, uh, see the paper I've, I've just uh, referred to. <clears throat> okay, so this test was um, confirmed by a company also in Virginia, used to be a lot happening in Virginia, a company called Ivo Limited, led by Richard Mansell. They, uh, they heard about this and in the liaison with myself and Becker and that. <clears throat> they set up a test and they used a pendulum, so they put their capacitor on a pendulum like this um, and they tested it in a vacuum, so this, this shows their capacitor in a vacuum chamber, which was done at E-Labs at Fredericksburg in Virginia, and they agreed with Becker and Bat. Uh, they, they also had a few innovations as well. They used a better dielectric, <coughs> hugely increasing the reliability, and they also stacked the capacitors to get a bit more thrust out. Okay, and just to show you the data, this, this shows the um, thrust they got at the y-axis and the voltage they applied on the x-axis, and what they were seeing was the, the black curve, and the theory predicts the blue the blue curve. So, do I predict the results very well in this case? <clears throat> okay, so then I used some DARPA money to set up a lab at Plymouth to do another test, test of this. <clears throat> and this is my engineer, uh, Richard Allendale, who uh, uh, built the setup. It's done this part of his PhD, and we we performed 222 tests of this. Um, you can see the capacitors were here inside a shielded cage. We have the electronic circuits here. We have digital balance, and we slowly improved our system. So we didn't connect the wires directly to the capacitor. We used liquid metal, uh, so we could connect without a, a physical a physical um, connection. <clears throat> And we uh, we got some good results as well. We managed to uh, uh, confirm the previous previous result. <clears throat> uh, so some of our results are shown here. So this shows the predicted change of mass. So what we expected to happen, and of the y-axis, the observed change of mass <laughs> in milligrams. <coughs> And this just shows that in order to encourage electrons to jump from the cathode to the anode, you have to heat, you have to heat the capacitor a little bit. Because if you don't, the, the data is not along the, the line of agreement here. But if you do heat it, the, the data is very good. And it, 
the agreement is very good. And I'm just writing a paper at the moment to summarise all the different tests that have been done in various labs, <clears throat> uh, five now. Uh, so these, this is the name of the lab, and I've had to blacken out the name of this one, because it's, um, I'm under a non-disclosure agreement. <clears throat> but uh, this shows the, the predicted thrust, the expected, <coughs> the thrust that was seen, whether it fit, and the number of newtons we got per kilowatt, which is a useful, uh, <clears throat> useful value. And you can see that in all these cases, in all these five labs, we're getting some good, good result. And Ivo have just gone one step further and have actually launched the test into space. <clears throat> so, um, back last November, they, they launched a 3U CubeSat on the SpaceX Falcon 9 with uh, two QI quantum drives on, on board. Um, that's of a specification they're supposed to produce 0.25 millimetres and another one 0.65 millimetres thrust. Um, so if you want to uh, follow on, you can follow Richard Mansell here or Ivo who, on Twitter. <clears throat> um, Next Big Future, which is a, a technological uh, blog, is also following along. So you can read articles like, like this one about it. So this is what the, the CubeSat looks like. But I, I won't say much more about this, this test because I'm under NDAs, uh, over it. Okay. So, <clears throat> what specific applications can this help with? Well, at the moment, all, most satellites use ion drives, which are just like rockets that use noble gases instead of uh, chemical fuel. Um, and a good example of this is a Dawn probe, which went to the minor planet series. Uh, this ion drive produced about 90 millimetres, which is about a gram of force, which is pretty small, but it was continuous and it built up over time. But the problem was that its weight was, was half a tonne, so it had to carry half a, half a tonne of propellant. And it needed about two kilowatts of power. But it managed to get from 0 to 60 miles per hour in, in one or two days. Now, according to what we've seen, even in our lab at Plymouth, which is not from 25 millinewtons, 25 milligrams, we can do much better because we can do essentially the same thing with a weight of only about three kilograms, but we don't need to carry fuel. <clears throat> There's no propellant, it's just the, a few cubes out to a small uh, spacecraft, and it would only need about, about a watt instead of two kilowatts. And the performance would be, would be equivalent. Um, more people needed. So, so this kind of um, engine on a satellite would be fantastic because, uh, for starts, it would be, it would last more or less forever because you wouldn't need fuel, the fuel would not run out. It would be pretty stealthy because there'd be no heat or no exhaust and it, it could be useful. So that's the obvious first application of this. <coughs> If we can manage to, to enhance it, and there are ways to enhance it, as you saw, if you, if you bring the plates together, the, the force goes up. Uh, but that's not, not easy, we should need a stronger dielectric as well, but we, we can look at that. Uh, satellite station keeping is a, a likely uh, application as well. And if we can enhance it enough to actually counter gravity, that would be uh, a, another great application for it. And I've also suggest suggested in papers that we could build self-thrusting materials. So if you had a material that had a, a different grain size in different parts of it, you could damp the zero point field more in one place than in another, and you could make the material self-thrust. So I've, I've published papers on that that you can look look at if you want. And then I suppose the most exciting application would be um, an interstellar probe. So not at the moment, we can't get to the nearest star in a human lifetime because in order to get up towards the speed of light, we need a massive amount of fuel, and that makes the spacecraft heavier, so we need even more fuel, so it becomes a big engineering problem. With a fuelless engine like this, it should be possible. <clears throat> so, for example, if you had a, a design that looked something like uh, the one shown here, 
we have an R2G producing power. We have lots of these capacitors <coughs> uh, combined in series. And in a camera, radio, and dish, we could we could have a probe which is seven kilograms or so with an interstellar shield, which would um, the capacitors would produce something like twenty six newtons of thrust, and it could accelerate to two point seven meters per second per second and get up to about half the speed of light in about two years. Um, so the, the upshot is that we could get to Proxima Centauri with this probe in something like 10 years, 10 or 15 years. Simply because we don't have to carry fuel. <clears throat> okay. Of course, getting a signal back would be a, a problem. So if we had a string of these these things, they could radio the uh, images back back to our solar system. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is, um, <clears throat> so just before I conclude, I, I just need to say that astronomy societies can contribute to this, this kind of work. I, I gave a talk to, a bit like this one, to an um, astronomy society in the UK, the Crawley Astronomy Society, and one of their members, Stephen Cookson, decided he'd like to help. So he got in touch with um, Xavier Hernandez, and they, they wrote a paper on wide binaries, looking at wide binaries, and this, this anomaly, and it's shown here, and you can see the um, uh, <clears throat> the citation for Stephen Cookson is Crawley Astronomical Society. So it is possible for astronomical societies to do uh, top class work and get get it public. Okay, so just to conclude, uh, quantized inertia. So this theory I've suggested promises a great leap forward in understanding technology. It's the first explanation for inertial mass. It predicts a minimum cosmic acceleration, which is getting me into a lot of trouble, I guess, because it violates uh, Newton's first law. But it's only a very slight violation. The acceleration, this minimum acceleration, is only about 10 to the minus 10 meters per second per second. It gets rid of G in physics that I haven't talked about, but it, it does. It gets rid of the need for the gravitational constant. It's been validated, the theory has been validated in space on galaxy rotation, wide binaries and other things. And so far, all labs directly have seen who I like thrust. Um, <clears throat> one of the labs I showed was, was a few years ago. Uh, and either we're doing a space test at the moment. <clears throat> so at the moment, the, the next step, well, I'm not exactly sure what my next step is going to be, but I'm intending or would like to set up what I call a Horizon Institute to try and work on this theory and enhance the thrust, collaborate on other CubeSat tests and work on quantum energy applications um, and try and, try and start uh, these, these interstellar missions, which I think are, are technically possible. And if you're interested, then I've, I've written a set of books. I've written a textbook on this theory called Physics from the Edge. I've written a, a science fiction called Falling Up, where I, I describe some of the applications <coughs> and a more recent sci-fi novel <coughs> called Hacking the Cosmos. Anyway, thanks very much to Boris for inviting me to talk. <coughs> and thank you for, for listening. I apologize for my cotton. Any questions? Questions. Boris has a question. <laughs> Mike, thank you very much for uh, bringing your theory to to us. Okay. Oh, oh. Um, sure. You're welcome. There's always there's always a, a bit of a, a point of confusion in my mind when statements are made about how the drive, the quantum drive, doesn't require fuel. And then there's another statement is made that does, doesn't require propellant. And I want to make sure that everybody understands that the propellant is just the matter that has to be thrown out so that you have a counter reaction according to Newtonian law, which will make your spacecraft go one way when you throw matter, such as a rocket exhaust, the other way. 
And in rockets, the fuel is the propellant. But what's also important to know is that your quantum drive does require power. And that means yes. it will require fuel of some kind. It's just not a, it's not a propellant. You're, in, in your designs, the fuel would be a, a radio nuclei, basically a nuclear reactor of some kind. Yes, yeah, so a solar panel for, for a or solar system. panels, right? You have to have a source of power. So, that, which brings me to the to the question. Now that I've tried to clarify that, um, this CubeSat has been up for like two months now, or something. And I know that the initial period of the orbit, uh, the initial period is to get data on a, sort of a baseline of the behavior of it in orbit before they turn those drives on. Do you know, you, can you give us any latest news on have they turned the drives on or have, you know, what's the schedule of getting data on that? Yeah, well, it's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm very sorry, but I'm, I'm bound by non-disclosure agreements and so I'm not, not talking about it. So I'd, I'd love to explain everything, but I, I can't. So, so I'm sorry about that. Okay, so we'll just follow uh... Mensel or whoever that was. So, so rephrase it in terms yeah. of when do you think you might be able to declare? With, you know, I, I understand your NDAs, but when do you think you might be able to, uh, you know, publish some results on this? What is your time frame if you have one? Yeah, well, I, I can't even answer that without compromising myself and getting yeah. into serious trouble. So, yeah, that's why I'll just have to say nothing. So I have a question. So um, DARPA obviously thought something of this. One point three million dollars is a nice amount of money to get. Uh, did they have any additional plans to fund with you know any more to uh, advance this or no? They have several new projects. Uh, there's one called Otter that they've just set up, which I think is seventeen million, which is going to be devoted to. Uh, this this kind of this kind of cluster. I don't know if I'm going to apply to be part of that because I've I've got other fish to to fry, maybe other funding opportunities. But DARPA are looking into it. Yes. Um, if you look at the Otter program, that's uh, an interesting one. Are any more papers in the pipeline for? Astronomical tests, you know, the white binaries tests, and well, you, you consider that to be pretty well proven now. <clears throat> yeah, I think white binaries are pretty well proven. Another one I'd like to try is the the bullet cluster, because that's very often used as proof of dark matter. But <clears throat> I think quantized inertia would predict it very well. Um, because, uh, the yeah, the, the, the bullet cluster, if you Look at a picture of the bullet cluster. The the places where they have to put the dark matter is at the two ends on the left and the right. And you can see that that is along the spin axis of the the cluster. And that is exactly where quantized inertia predicts that inertia should be lost and light should bend more. So I'd like to do some modeling of that. I have a question. Um, I came across a paper that looked at the way you approximate the the unher radiation, um, and they found issue with the, the fact that if you do try, if you consider the full spectrum of the radiation, that it the theory has issues predicting classical mechanical events, uh, moving acceleration to be proportional to force and inversely proportional to mass to being f equals ma to the Four. And I was wondering if that was in 2019. I'm wondering if you've had any, you've seen that and if you've had any response to it. Oh, is that the paper by Dick, Dick Renatel? It, it may, it, I believe so. Yes. Um, yeah, there, there was an error in their mathematics that I can't really go into, but if if you email me, I can send you my detailed response to it. Their, right. their derivation, what they're use, what they're using is a straw man. It's not really quantized emission. So I don't think what they're saying is valid. 
Um, okay. There's another paper by Rendo et al, which is better and has some genuine criticisms, which I've now um, surmounted. I've, I've derived the theory a different way to avoid that problem. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for your question. Good question. One more question. We have one in the back. So dark matter and dark energy have been basically used um, in some simulations to, to kind of fill in the gaps to explain how um, the universe basically kind of expanded and clumped into a kind of matter and got to the we know. Um, have you used quantum mechanics in this and in this area as well to explain universe and galaxy cluster formation instead of dark matter? <clears throat> yes, so I've used it, uh, as I said, for um, uh, for galaxies, and I've also applied it to galaxy clusters, and it works for them as well. I mean, like specifically, like the kinds of models that like kind of look at the expansion of the universe using like a, that currently need dark matter to work. Have you like replaced dark matter with quantum inertia in these kinds of modeling? Yeah, I'm having a bit of difficulty hearing you, so I hope I'm answering the right question. But yes, I can effectively get rid of dark matter completely, and also dark energy as well, because the, the acceleration of the cosmos that they try to explain by adding dark energy, that acceleration is actually the minimum acceleration that is predicted by quantized inertia. So you, you don't need the dark energy either. Uh, that actually, that, that I, have a good, I have a question that follows up to that. Um, uh, supermassive black hole formation, at least from what I understand, requires some form of dark matter seeding, even with the most massive population three and like 3.1 stars. Does, does QI help fix that as well? Or without dark matter present, how do you form these enormous black holes? Oh, yes, I haven't really looked at black holes. Um... So, yeah, quantized inertia would make some, would predict black holes slightly differently than we would expect. Um, for example, it would get rid of the singularity at the center because, um, as well as having a, a minimum acceleration, quantized inertia also predicts a maximum acceleration, which is about 10 to the 52 meters per second per second. So we get rid of the nasty singularities that we have in black holes. <clears throat> I haven't modeled the formation of them, so I, I can't directly answer your question. Okay, thank you. We have a question online, I think. Someone wants to know when your next book is coming out. Oh, yes. Well, it's probably in about six months, something like that. I'm just finishing some editing of the last chapter now. And when I send it off to the publisher, I expect about six months after that. Okay. Any more questions online? I don't think so. Well, thanks very much for having me. Mike, we thank you very much um, for your talk. Of course, you'll be getting another payment, but I won't disclose what that is. But, I'm to Thank but you, in man. addition to that, every speaker that speaks to our club gets this very valuable and much coveted <laughs> cash mug. <laughs> Not only it has the logo on here, but also very useful, even for people studying quantum inertia, a schedule of um, meteor events. So whenever you have your coffee in the morning, you can check the dates and see if there's going to be a meteor storm or something like that. We'll, we'll try to get to them. Oh, thank you very much. Sorry. We're going to try to get to them in 0.5, so you have to be like Oh, yes, yes. We'll put a quantum uh, thruster on there. <laughs> now I'll get your address in the email, and we'll send you the smile. Yeah, great. I'll, it'll be an honor to, to have it. Thank you. <laughs> All right, now it's your bedtime.
Yeah, that's right. It's about half past one for me, so in the morning. But I have some coffee, so. That's <laughs> right. All right, so we have, uh, we just have to get the uh, little box out here. Did everybody get to put the name in the box for the, uh, um, no, right. Well, I need over, Evan. Here comes the door for us. You are welcome to leave, by the way, as everything after this is, will perhaps not be very interesting to you. <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Is anybody else, uh, okay, here's a couple of people. I'll put my name in there. So, you know,